Hello and welcome back to part two of the discussion on Bundle Branch Blocks. I'm Adam Thompson, your host and educator, so to speak. Okay, in, in part one we just discussed really quickly the method that everybody kind of knows to discover uh, what type of Bundle Branch Block you have. If you have a wide QRS complex with a superventricular rhythm, so you have some sort of aberrant conduction, you would look at lead V1 and identify if the last wave of the QRS complex is up or down. A lot of people identify it as the, the majority, they'll say is the majority of the QRS complex positive or negative. Usually if you do that method you won't be wrong, but truly it should be the last wave of the QRS complex, it's called the terminal wave. And we said if it was up, it's, it's indicative of a right bundle branch block, and if it was down, it was indicative of a left bundle branch block. And I kind of taught you the turn signal method to remember that. Uh, remember, if you, if you push up on your turn signal, you're turning to the right. And if you push down, you're turning to the left. Okay, so using that method, you can, you can identify that these are a lot of the different uh, morphologies of a right bundle branch block in V1. Notice all of these have a positive wave uh, as its terminal wave. The last wave of the QRS complex is upright and positive. Notice this one. It's mostly a negative wave, but the last wave is positive. Okay, so that's one of those that I was explaining. So these are all right bundle branch block morphologies. And, and the, what I kind of left you with in, in the discussion last time was that I didn't tell you everything. With a true right bundle branch block, you will have this uh, pattern, so to speak. The last wave in lead 1 and in lead V6 should be negative. It should be a slurred S wave, so to speak. They call it a slurred S wave in the textbooks. And I'll kind of give you some intuition behind that and explain why it happens. So if this is our ventricles, that's our left bundle branch right there. This is our ventricles, okay? And let me just make my pin a little bit bigger. And let's say we have a left bundle branch block. So this side is blocked. All right. We said that if we were looking at V1 and conduction was coming down, it would first go this way really fast and then go from cell to cell to cell to cell to cell back to the left side because this is our left ventricle over here and our right ventricle over here. So since the left bundle branch is blocked and the, and the right isn't, you get fast conduction to the right and then slow conduction back to the left. And we said because that happens, you get a quick little positive R wave in V1 and then a big wide negative S wave in V1. And it would look something like that. Well, now picture what it would look like over here. Over here. What if your positive electrode was over here? Well, that's what exactly what happens with lead 1 and V6. The positive electrode is at the lateral wall over here. So what you're going to see in lead 1 and V6 is mostly, actually kind of like right here, mostly you're just going to get a uh, positive big monophasic R wave because it's going towards this big wide conduction, it's going towards the lateral wall, lead 1 to V6. So you just get mostly this big positive upright R wave. Now what if it was a right bundle branch block? Well. Let's do it again. A right bundle branch block would be blocked over here, okay, and your conduction would go normally, again, in V1 we know what happens, it goes this way, and then from cell to cell to cell to cell back this way, all right, you might have a little bit of septic conduction to begin with, so you'll get something like this with a right bundle branch block in V1. But over here, what's going to happen? Well, the conduction's going towards and then away, towards, and then away. And that's why you get the slurred S wave, because that big, long conduction, is uh, that wide wave is going to be the slurred S wave and leads 1 and V6. Okay? And that's the intuition behind that. So to be a true right bundle branch block, you have to have a terminal R wave, or positive wave, in V1 and a terminal S wave in leads 1 and V6. Okay, 
let's take a look at this example. You can note here the QRS complex is wide at 134 milliseconds. Anything greater, it, this is greater than 120 milliseconds, and 120 milliseconds is equal to 0.12 seconds. Whatever you want to say it, they're both the same. So anything greater than that is wide. So do we have P waves? That's going to be our first question, and yes, we do. And they're with every QRS complex just like they should be. So it's a sinus rhythm. So we look at V1 to identify what type of bundle branch block we're dealing with. And remember, we're going to find our J point, draw the line backwards. And if it's up, we imagine us pushing, pushing up on our turn signal, and that would make us indicate that we're turning to the right. So this is a right bundle branch block morphology in V1. What about lead one and V6? Lead one. Yes, you do have a slurred S wave or terminal S wave. Same thing in V6. So that is indicative of a right bundle branch block. This is a right bundle branch block pattern. Let's take a look at another example really quickly. Again, it's Y, our Q restoration, 134 milliseconds. Want to make sure we see some P waves. We do, we have some, some P waves here, and they're with every QRS complex. Again, you don't have to have P waves, but you definitely want to make sure it's a supraventricular rhythm. This one's rather quick, 124, it says the uh, rate is. Uh, so we look at V1, we look at V1 to identify what kind of bundle branch block we have, our last wave is upright. Our last wave is certainly upright. Okay, so this is indicative of a right bundle branch block. Now we have to look at lead 1 and V6. Lead 1. Again, we have that terminal S wave. Terminal S wave, okay? And that is also indicative of a right bundle branch block as well as V6. Again, terminal S wave and V6. Good. So that's a good example of a right bundle branch block as well. This one, in fact, is something called a bifascicular block. You see those stars there? We usually see those stars when it says unconfirmed or acute MI or bifascicular block, little asterisks. And the reason it's so important is because we know we have three fascicles total. We have the single fascicle to the right, and we have the left anterior and left posterior fascicle of the left bundle branch block. What this is saying is that we have the right bundle branch is completely blocked and our left anterior fascicle is blocked as well. So the only one remaining, the only normal lane of conduction we have left is the left posterior fascicle. And if we lose that, we'll have AB disassociation, most likely a complete heart block. I'm not gonna get into how you identify it uh, by the use of, use of axis determination just yet. I will tell you that I, I'm going to do a video on that eventually and uh, you can go if you don't want to wait to ems12lead.com and look at their access uh, tutorial because it's really good. Tom Buffale does a great job teaching that. So in V1 we get morphologies similar to this. Our terminal wave is negative with a left bundle branch block. And with a left bundle branch block this is what you should see in lead one and V6, a big monophasic R wave. You might have a little bit of a negative deflection, uh, but for the most part, you should have just a monophasic R wave in, with a left bundle branch block and leads one in V6, and in V1, the terminal negative wave. Here's an example. And you'll notice something with left bundle branch blocks, they look to be a lot wider. They'll look a lot uglier too, they look more uh, malignant, for lack of better words. They, they look like something's wrong with these patients. Well, they tend to be worse because, remember, you have two fascicles on the left. So every left bundle branch block is a bifascicular block, and most of our myocardiums on the left. So you're definitely having a lot more of that slow cell-to-cell -cell conduction over there um, where you're taking the back roads for a longer duration. So that might be why you're a little bit wider. Look at the QRS duration here, 162 milliseconds. Remember, 
if you have a wide QRS complex, you're thinking of only a few things. Uh, supraventricular rhythm with aberrancy, a ventricular arrhythmia, or hyperkalemia uh, would be another thing, but that patient would probably be acutely ill, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be trying to identify bundle branch blocks uh, and hopefully trying to treat that patient for their condition. So we have a wide rhythm. Uh, we do have P waves. At first you might be concerned, well, are those P waves married to the QRS complexes? Yes, they are. In fact, we have a, a regular PR interval of, of 270 milliseconds. I say it's regular, but it's, it's definitely prolonged. It's regular because it's consistent, but it's prolonged, so you have a first degree AV block. Okay, so it's a supraventricular rhythm with aberrancy. We have a wide QRS complex, so look at V1. V1, the last wave, it's definitely negative. So that's a left bundle branch block. Remember, if you push down, because this is down, if you push down on your turn signal, you're turning to the left. So that's how we remember this is a left bundle branch block. But we still have to look at lead one and V6. And we should see monophasic R waves, which we do. Uh, this here is just a, a, a premature atrial contraction, I'm sure. And lead one, monophasic R waves, V6, monophasic R waves. This all fits the left bundle branch block pattern, which the GE Marquette interpretive algorithm has identified up there as well. All right, looking, looking for the next one. This has a little bit of a baseline artifact, but we still want to try to identify what we got here. Okay, first thing, it's Y. 134 milliseconds, it's wide. Is it supraventricular? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I see P waves just yet. Uh, in fact, we do have some P waves. We have a P wave there and there. They're just much harder to see. Uh, the, the monitor certainly sees them. It's a sinus rhythm. We're gonna look at V1 now because we know it's wide and supraventricular. And we notice that the last wave is negative. And we said that indicates a left bundle branch block pattern. Now looking at lead 1 and V6, we see our upright monophasic R waves. So this is a left, left bundle branch block pattern again. Left bundle branch block pattern again. Good. We have another option though with this type of aberrancy. It's called a non-specific intraventricular conduction delay. And what this is, is it doesn't really fit. It's not a left bundle branch block, and it's not a right bundle branch block. It has a little bit of both. What do I mean? Well, if you look at this one in V1, you have a left bundle branch block pattern. But in leads 1 and V6, you have a right bundle branch block pattern. So it doesn't really fit. It's considered a non-specific IBCD. And it kind of fits in the same realm as bundle branch blocks, but it could be indicative of other pathologies, such as hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is a common cause of a non-specific intraventricular conduction delay. So you have to try to identify it. This is V1, it's going to be whether you know if you can call STEMI or not. If, the, if V1 follows the left bundle branch block morphology, it's going, to, it's going to follow the same rules as your agency does as far as calling a STEMI in the presence of left bundle branch block. So remember, we don't generally do that. There is criteria out there for calling a STEMI uh, and I'm going to show that in a video. If you want to look at my, uh, my channel on YouTube, you'll find a video about identifying uh, STEMI in the presence of left bundle branch block. It's through the use of something called Scarbosa's criteria. But for this discussion, I just wanted to mention uh, nonspecific IVCDs. And here's an example. You'll see you have a left bundle branch block morphology here in V1, but if you look at V6, you have a right bundle branch block morphology. So it doesn't really fit either one, so it's considered a non-specific intraventricular conduction delay, and the monitor, in fact, has even identified it as that. So that's it for the bundle branch block dis uh, discussion. I just wanted to show you a quick list of these pathologies here. You'll notice bundle branch block, these are all different causes of axis deviation. You'll notice bundle branch blocks uh, cause all kinds of axis deviation. Okay, so when we get into the axis determination tutorial, uh, you're going to see that bundle branch blocks will in fact cause a complete alteration of axis. And that's what we talked about earlier in part one 
when you follow the wave of the polarization with the bundle branch block, what actually happens. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Uh, subscribe to my channel. Uh, check out the other videos on EKGs, 12 leads. I have all kinds of cases that I've discussed and capnography stuff. There's going to be more coming soon on drug math and everything you can think of pre-hospital. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Have a good one, and I'll see you next time.